are live once more. I took a little break because I had to edit some things, but um, yeah, for sure. We got, I know, and we, I know we rushed through this boat here. Like we rushed through it, then we were onto something, then it was out of the garage. You never got to see it finished. And that's because I was like rushing to get it done uh, for my guys to be down here. We ended up mostly just going on my boat and they did take it out once, but I, I was thinking that we would be out in two, three boats most of the time, but it just didn't happen that way. People were doing things and, uh, oh, well, it was better, better to have it than not. So just, um, what's going on guys? I think the life is not picked up or any picked up quite yet, but it's getting up there. So just kind of hang around and chill. Who do we got in the chat? Is the chat working? Am I seeing anybody here? What's going on, Ian? How's it going? Yeah, I was gonna clean it out so it looks somewhat presentable. And we'll talk about what we got going on. But we do have a true budget build here, guys. 12 in the live. Can I get 12 likes? The more likes, the more people pour in, the better the live stream is, the more people see it. You know, kind of the whole spiel. Well, let's talk about what we got going on here since you lucky 12 get to see the boat. So what is this thing? I mean, you guys saw it almost done, but hey, it's going on, Ethan. It's going on, Calvin. So here it is actually done. Um, and so this was that Tracker Tournament V17, the old school, who knows what year it was, riveted hull. It is here now. I didn't ever get to attach the, the tag to it. Let me go see. Remember I had a tag to it, guys? I had like... And I don't have my, uh, I lost my little, my little stick thing that I carry around. So I'm just kind of freehanding it today, but I think it's actually more stable in the hand. So, I got crap. I'm gonna, I'm gonna garage purge and mission. Oh, here it is. Yeah. All right. It is not going to tell me. I don't actually know what year it is, but this is the, this is the boat. Is this, is this, yeah. This is the boat. This is a Tournament V17, Bash Tracker Corporation, Lebanon, Missouri. Is that backwards when you guys read it? It's 1,200 pounds, person's motor and gear, 80 horsepower motor. They did have a legitimate 80 horsepower motor on it. And those old Mercs that were 80, those things screamed. Those two strokes, they were pretty serious. They were legit. So, but we, um, we tried to replace it with his, with uh, not an 80 horse, but we'll talk about that here. 39 in the live, guys. Can we get 39 likes? We got 13. Get 30 more. Let's, let's get some likes in here. Exit the chat. You'll see the like button. Hit it. And that just helps the live go uh, a lot more seamlessly and, and true. Anyways, we did end up getting rid of the old and archaic 80 horse that didn't work anymore. Um, not that I didn't want it to work. There's just no more serviceable parts for something that old. It was super old, like one of the original. And so I ha had this one in my spare reserve. I had originally had this motor for a rental boat. So this is a 60 horse, I think a Gen 2. It was just, it was just slight of a Gen 3. It's, it has a Gen 3 cal. So it's got a good lower, it had a brand new lower unit. So the motor itself did all right. We stuck a 14 pitch uh, four blade on it. Really needs a 13 pitch four blade. Um, it did kind of drag out of the hole a little bit, but we got almost a max speed of about 30 miles an hour with four people. And so it was okay. It did okay with the 60. 60 did lift it out. Um, I was going to put a 40 on here, but after how, how much it drug with the 60, I'm real glad the 60 is on here. It just happened to be that way because I think the 40 would have underperformed. We'd have went like a whole whopping 20, 25 miles an hour on a 10 pitch prop the same size, you know, with the same shaft diameter down there. Um, and I don't know with the 60, the 50 and specifically the 60, you're able to really carry that higher pitch. It's really about a pitch. You think about the 40 to 60 horse block is the same. The motor is the same. I mean, one's watered down and one's maxed out same block. And really you, you get the, you get the performance out. Um, you know, like that one is a, that's a 14 pitch four blade and you can run a 13 it'll run a little bit better but if i had a 50 i'd have to be running a 12 max a 13 max a 13 would probably perform 
like a 14 performance on this one and I would go slower. See what I'm saying? And then I'd be on horse, I'd be running a 12 or an, an 11 pitch on a 40. And at that point in time, you're losing like a few miles an hour. Or so we're at almost 30 here with that one. And then I'd end up hitting down 28, 25 to 20, like to under 25. So that motor probably pushed four people at around 20, 25, between 20 and 25 miles an hour or 40 would, but because we have that extra horse, we can get 30. And uh, I don't know. And I, one thing that we did, I did fail at was uh, gauging the motor height, but thank heaven I bought a nice uh, crane. Like, I'm sorry, a motor jack. I bought a nice motor jack from Harbor Freight and it works perfectly to lift this thing off. I have... By the way, guys, I have the video coming out tomorrow for this thing. It's an hour long, super raw. I shot the whole thing on my iPhone, just not in my normal quality of filming, but I was just, I went around and vlogged the whole thing pretty much. And there's, only, it's just, it's, it's different, but that's how I was able to record it because I was just going to blow right through this and then tell you guys all about it. I was like, no, nah, I need to show people how I did this. And then the cooler thing is the actual boat build, the raw materials into the boat, not just the add-on accessories, but um, this boat, I mean, the motor here, see the hole here? The whole matters. So it, it initially kind of freaked me out <clears throat> because the way the way the motor was, I thought it was going to hang too low. And um, I'll tell you what, or hang too high. So I put it on the lowest hole, but it needs to go two holes up, maybe three. That's like four hole settings right there. One, two, three, five hole settings. Probably go in the middle hole setting. That it needs to go higher for sure because that jack plate is all the way up. And you can tell you can't you can't go not one little bit more up so fail there but we'll fix that um i did hide the jack plate button so like the people who rent this boat so the people who rent this boat can't actually mess with it i'm mean, gonna mess with the power trim that's bad enough and then um but here check this here's the whole thing out remember we we had like three different types of hatches on here you got your auto boat sweet good job Mark, yeah, the autoboat systems are legit. We're going to put one on a, on a little old Palm Prowler 8. I actually got that OG Palm Prowler 8 back. It's sitting in my driveway. I just got it dropped off by a friend of mine who was holding on, holding on to it for me for a little bit. So we'll be able to, like, put that on that here in a little bit. Uh, I do love the autoboat system. It's freaking sweet. Uh, actually, how we'll, I'll talk about that here in a little bit. But let's go back to the, to the boat build. So over here, I mean, these are one of our... We have, like... I don't know. We just have a series of different ways you can do hatches. A, a pretty, pretty current. Like, so this is a kayak hatch, a Hobie hatch. Look at the Hobie, the Hobie logo. I've been holding onto this for like eons. And that's just specifically, it was just like a perfect little, little maintenance hatch. That's all it is. So you can access stuff down there. Um, and then this is our, one of our traditional store-bought hatches, like, like that we make our dry hatches and this one is pretty supreme quality this is the nicest hatch we have in the whole thing if we're being completely honest you know it comes reinforced with a with a pretty generous gusset you know it's already bent welded machine and powder coated all the same thing on the frames and the tracks and then the only thing different here is you can tell can you tell you probably can't because i can only i only can really tell because i see the slightest raised lip but probably in the, in the camera you can't even tell but we did not flush mount this we cut the hole in the in the deck Stuck it right on the deck and turfed right over it. And that was per popular request of the people who weren't terribly happy with me. Um, they weren't, they didn't care, but it was just like a lot of extra work to go and route one eighth inch down. So the hatch is completely flush with the, with the deck. Now, there are certain cases where that's absolutely necessary. Um, like with line teak, you'll be able to see the shadow bevel up. But with camo, no, you'll never see it. You'll never see it ever. <clears throat> So you can't even see. Look, can you tell there's a groove there? No. Barely, maybe. Look, bare. Nobody cares. Nobody cares. Is it? You save yourself so much extra work by not having to like route that out. It's stupid. I just use self tappers on everything. Self tappers through here. Self tappers into the frame. Self tap. I self tapped everything. Usually I'll rivet, and then countersink down, and so the rivet kind of fits flush in there, so you don't see the rivet head. And that's just so much extra work. I just use the same the self tappers on everything. And that dramatically increased everything. Just, and so I'm a little sketched about it because, you know, cell tappers into thin aluminum. But some of the aluminum is fairly thick. You know, the thinner aluminum, I was just very careful. And I put more of them, like a lot of them. 
Um, and you, you can't see none of them. They're all, they're all flushed here. This bow plate is actually all wood. That's the stock piece that actually went up to the current bow plates. And um, remember, we, we went, went three-quarter inch wood. This is all wood, by the way. All this is wood. This is all turfed. We did turf the front deck live. And so this is how the rest of the boat came out. So this was one sheet, surprisingly. One sheet covered the middle, and then the, the, the last little two ends kind of covered it. We had a little bit left over, but really not a lot. Really not a lot for the, for the whole sheet. And then the other pieces we kind of just used to piece in. So let me answer some questions here. Let me see. What do you got here? Gilbert Hernandez. You have a 1997 Bass Tracker. Oh. Hold on. And you believe you're going to have to replace the safety lanyard switch? I don't know. Depends on what generation you have. If you have like a Gen 1 like this one. It's got a pretty unique switch. Like, I, I look for this. You can't really find it in Walmart. I almost had to go to a boat shop to find one. Um, it's got it. It doesn't look like that. If I lose this safety lanyard switch, I think I'm screwed. I actually took off the old string and just reattached a new string on it. So, so I don't even know. Like, that's the that's lanyard on here, but this is a Generation 1. This is a newer one for the four, for the four strokes. I think that the one that was on here was old and archaic and went, went to the, the first generation two strokes. So, yeah, my dogs, what are my dogs barking at? You guys hold on a second. This is weird. Is there a legitimate threat out here or are you just barking to bark? All right, well, I don't know. Sorry. I had to make sure. I don't know. It's pretty peaceful out here, but some, you just never know. It's that one time where you over, you underestimate like the, the peacefulness. But anyways, let's go back to the whole thing here. Thank you guys for coming in here. 43 in the live. Can I get 43 likes? Really, really appreciate it. Budget topic. Graphs would be 93 SV with 54 transducer. Worth it. Um, how much? Well, I don't know. Like, I put a UH, I bought a UHT2 uh, Echo Map, and I think that has the newer transducer. And I put both of them. I put the UHD one on top of the UHD two. Like I had the UHD two specifically for traditional sonar because I wanted it to look better. I stuck that on the light skip. So the latest video I released in the light skip had the UHD one and two. And the UHD two has a much more intuitive interface. It's easier to use. It's better, but it's not so much better that it's like 500 bucks more or however much more it is. I would just get a UHD one. I would get a I would get a UHD one, standard UHD Garmin Echo Map. And I don't know if they have a, if they have differences in transducers. Just one's just going to be more powerful and it's going to reach out better with a little bit better clarity. It depends on how big your lake is and what you're searching for. Um, I I don't know. Like they're going to read out in the graph very, fairly similar. Just one's just going to be more powerful. That's all. They're not going to not one's not going to be more clear. One's just going to be able to reach out more. Recommendations. So what's going on? Just buck around. Recommendations on replacing bow eye. You broke the bow eye. Oh no. Um, you can use a D-ring with the backing of, a, of metal, but if it's cracked and you let, if it just, if it's just the bow eye that broke, it should just be a bolt. It should just have a, a nut in the back you can unscrew. Um, that's been my, that's been, that's been uh, my experience in most times. Six rivets. Um, you're probably going to have to use, you probably have to drill those out. You have to drill those out like perfectly i would get a eighth inch drill bit or smaller and i would drill right in that hole like look right here let me show you well this bow eye is much more like what i would think you would have which is just a d-ring that's sealed and so that's what i would replace it with once you get that one off i mean they were talking about buck rivets into there you're gonna have to get a small buck rivet. like ping it like you know punch it uh, like a hole to start, like a little divot right in the middle, and you drill directly in the middle with a one eighth, and then you go follow it with the three sixteenths. And if as long as it's right in the middle, you'll be able to get that buck rivet out with very, very little or no damage to the hull. You'll be able to pry it out once the rivet itself is hollow. So generally, they're three sixteenth inch thick in. These are all three sixteenth inch thick in. Uh, it'd be really, really rare if you found one fourth inch buck rivets. It'd be extremely strange. I wouldn't expect it.
Um, but when you do fix it, just get a D ring like that. That's what I would do. That's what I would do. A 14 foot line V hole. You just took the seats out. Okay. I mean, we can help you with the layout plan. You just got to hit us up crypto. How do your boats not leak with all the rivets you put in? Um, I don't put any rivets. What's going on, Nate? I don't put any rivets under the water line. And if they are under the water line, they're buck rivets. And those, those are pretty solid. And if, and if it's not a buck rivet, it's a closed and pop rivet with sealant. And the closed and pop rivet is standalone. It's just going through the hole and pulling to seal the hole. It's not holding two pieces together. So if you like use a pop rivet underneath the water line to hold like, hold like framing to the hull, then that will almost definitely start leaking right away and fail. So your, the, your only option with a rivet to, to bind something to the hull without welding is a buck rivet. And it's just such a pain, but it's sometimes the only way it's, it's the least invasive way. If you don't have anybody who can weld or you yourself can't weld, or it's a million dollars to get somebody who will come down to weld. Um, a lot of welders in my experience, even when I had money down here, were afraid to touch an aluminum hole. They were like, and it might just be my, my region where I just very unluckily had, had a bunch of welders here who just did not want to touch aluminum. And I went to the aluminum shop. I mean, I went to the, I went to the weld shop, talked to their welders. I went to, some other places and i just i don't know i just couldn't find one that wanted to they were like no just use epoxy they, they said they said made every excuse and i was like i'll pay you anything you want please weld this hole oh well you know uh. that's what it was like so that's, that's kind of how like i i uh it's kind of how i just like you just got sometimes you gotta do things yourself right <laughs> that's the diy channel when it, hey nate do you know when the light camel's coming back that's a nate question it's really not even our, it's a, that's a Nick question, but Nate's here. So, um, sweet. Heck yeah. Nate solved problems. All righty. Yeah. Okay. Great. I'm glad that, so you, it's, it's a very doable thing to get out buck rivets. You just gotta, you just, it's a process. It's a three, it's a three step process, right? Punch, small drill bit, and then three sixteenth inch drill bit. And you'll take that buck rivet right out. And then otherwise, don't widen the hole. What you don't want to do is widen the hole. And that would be very bad. All right, let me see if I got... Okay. Let me see. Okay. All right, I think I caught up on most of the questions. So Mark Foster, you got a you got a Palm Parlor 10. I, I did a restoration or I did a conversion on Palm Parlor 10s on YouTube. It's pretty crazy. Let me. All right. Let me gator back some flashlight line. I need to do that to my boat. 100 percent I have not gator backed my trailer. I've done everything else to my trailer. It looks really sick, but it doesn't light up, and that's a problem. But I'm just so burnt out on doing things. But I should do that fairly quickly. What? We're not getting the light back? What? They need to run that by headquarters. That's strange. The dark looks better, if we're being honest. So if we just only get the dark, it's still better looking, but but the light was nice. It had its own unique look. You know, it's all about preference. So that's unfortunate. But here, let's talk about let's talk about the boat again. Um so while we're here. Again, we just talked about this hatch being we'll leave this one open since we've covered it. We went from plastic kayak hatch to Nate's dry hatch, which fit in here perfect. We got struts, pretty powerful struts. I think these are, I don't know. I think these actually are just two 100 inch struts, but they're pretty good. Um, they hold this hatch up quite nicely. This thing is not always going to be here. Um, it's just here for, for demoing purposes. And here's the big thing. Like, I'm going to show you this hatch. I'll be right back with this one. So let's go back to what we did back here. So remember, I don't know if you remember this, but all the old trackers, the pre-Johnny Morris era, and maybe even the Johnny Morris era, I don't know, like the actual Fisher Marine era, that's what this tracker looks like. Looks like a Fisher Marine tracker. They, uh, you know, they had the, the typical bloated back where they just poured the foam in and it bloated against the aluminum, and the aluminum on top of the deck was very thin, so it bloated. I mean, it bowed up. You can see that physically. Can you see it? You can see that, right? It looks like an like a top of a of a of a bread loaf. It's like all round, so looks like that on both sides. 
And then they stuck they stuck something look that is very similar to what Nate did up there, but they stuck it right on top of the deck that's bloated. And then they added the wood wrapped in carpet on top of an aluminum of a very, very extra long aluminum hinge that covered the underneath of the wood. And then like then they had some other things here for the back and the front. They which are actually aluminum lids. The only aluminum lids in this whole thing were actually the live wall lid and the rear lid, which did not convert over to this conversion here. So uh that was like that was like a problem. So how do we convert all this to turf? What's going on now? How are you? How are you? So how do we convert all this to turf? Well, let's let's show you. So this was half inch. We converted it to three quarter inch. Cause I mean, by the time this thing sits on this little track thing here, it's three quarter inch. And then that's what sit flush with, with the top. So we just, we went from the half inch to three quarter inch. What made the half inch three quarter inch is it was wrapped in carpet. Since we're not wrapping it in carpet anymore. And then we also needed a smaller gap, a much smaller gap because there was like almost a one inch gap in the other hatch, because that's how much carpet bunches together. Once you close the hatch that you need that gigantic gap. And so when you go to turf over stock hatches, it just doesn't look right. And then it wouldn't actually look right because it was too low. So thicker wood, all resin coated and then painted. And then, uh, and then, so it's there and that, that came out pretty good. We haven't used these yet, but I mean, they look good. You step on them. They feel extremely solid, extremely solid. Um, remember those like cal induction looking things that one was facing this way and one was facing that way. We actually just got, um, these little angled vent screens from like an RV shop and stuck them in there instead. One's facing the vents this way and one's facing that way. It probably will not grab air as good as say a cow would, but it will kind of, the air that does fly over, it will scoop it and go in and casually push it out that vents. But, um, oh shit. Oh. Hey man, now I'm sorry to hear that, dude. Um. Thing. Well, hopefully. Here, oh, call me a little bit after this live. We'll talk. We'll talk about it. Um. Uh, shit. All right. I hear about divorces, but uh, let's talk. I mean, we'll talk. We'll we'll talk soon now. So, anyways, here, this is the back hatch. So, this one is also all wood. So, this is like a super old school. school. Yeah, it's it's all good. We'll we'll talk about it later, um, for sure. We'll talk about it off the live. And then, so this is a, a straight wood hatch. And this is an old school. This is how we used to do it, straight old school, like way back in the day. Like how the tiny boat nation started was by making, like crazy wood hatches that nobody would make and so that part of that crazy process was we we did a lot more elaborate back in the day this was brushed and you can tell you just look at it but um before we would we would absolutely make sure they were polished smooth on the ends perfect and then painted even to to, to actually no we didn't paint them because we would we would notoriously carpet them underneath here and then in, in this section because we had this extra lip area um we would like put cosmetic matting like a little flat bar designs and it would look really good you make the the wood hatches look way better than like say an aluminum hatch but they just didn't last very long um the process to make a wood hatch last is a very tedious process and we did do that process here and part part of that process is resin coating it for one the whole anything that is wood in this boat is resin coated and it is uh it's just legit it's that's the best way you're going to get any sort of real life out of a wood hatch. you got to resin coat it with slow cure. And then if you want to do multiple coats, if you have cheaper non-marine grade plywood, uh, it did hold Nate. Yes. Nate did actually test this boat. Nate and Anthony together actually tested this boat in its first legitimate working function. Um, the strength or span of a wood hatch is stronger than that of an aluminum hatch. See how we had to gusset that one? This one is more or less the same size as that one. It needs no gusset because three-quarter inch plywood is extremely strong. <laughs> but these, but the whole thing, another thing that keeps the hatches straight and not warping over time is an extra lip. So 
So this is actually, this, this is what made this hatch so hard to convert that I ended up going a wood hatch. For one, because it's budget friendly. This is a budget build. I could I had aluminum and I was going to pull the trigger and just make my own hatch out of tubing and then sheet metal. And I was like, no, nobody's going to want to see that. I mean, nobody's going to be able to do that. But you can do this all day. You can go get marine resin from like the marine shop or you can go even go get just two-part epoxy resin from Hobby Lobby and you can just layer in and penetrate the wood and then get it ready. And then these are just strips of the same piece of wood. It's actually Kusa board, but I'm saying like in, in, in normal circumstances, if I didn't have this stuff, I would just use the wood lip. Um, this three quarter inch and this half inch. So inch and a quarter all together. And that's the inch and a quarter gap here. We ran all the way around here. Then I ended up making my own hinge. So we sell these, these hinges. We, we, we get a lot of extended like offset hinges that come out way out like that. We sell a lot of those. I mean, a lot of people are actually doing wood hatches most of the time. And so it's a regular item we sell. I ended up welding that together because I just didn't want to wait for it to be shipped. It would have taken too long. So I was, I was on a deadline, but two struts back here. And I think those are, yeah, hundred in struts. So two struts. This actually feels extremely solid. It has been out in the sun. It has been out there. No warping. Um, and I do expect it to last a long time. It has no back lip here because this was actually elevated. None of it, nothing was flush. You know why this whole thing worked? Because there was carpet everywhere. But the minute we kept taking off the carpet, the, the longer I saw this boat bill dragging out. Because you really just saw how much carpet covered everything. You can even see it there. See that gap? There's just a bunch of little pieces everywhere. Individual pieces. And it was terrible. A lot of we so we added a lot more rivets to reinforce because they because they did like the minimum amount of rivets possible to make this work. So there's like three here, two over here. I added made so there's like five or six on the one piece. I almost welded this directly here, but I I didn't. I mean, after we after we welded this little piece of bar here, that actually evened it out. So now it sits flush. That it had just the perfect little piece of aluminum bar. I don't know what that is. That's like half inch by. I don't know what it is, but that's flat that's like that's straight aluminum solid stock we welded that right there put that there and it's flush and it's flush and um so everything works here and let me get to the back of the transom in a second but i also want to show you the live wall lid the live wall lid is made the same way okay and so in a normal sense, when I wasn't rushing, I would have went back over this with some like oil-based enamel, and I might still actually do that just, just for uh, aesthetic sake. But um, the hatch itself came out pretty good, and then you can actually see the the hinge, and the some of the welds. But we sell these offset hinges, and they specifically convert to wood hatches all day. You can make the wood as thick as you want, inch, three-quarter inch, inch and a quarter, which is with these. And so there was no way I was going to generate an inch and a quarter hatch without some serious conversion and, and doing some other nonsense. So the wood hatch is just, it was just a time to do them again. People have been asking for them. So here they are. And can you, when you look at them, what do you see? Can you tell the difference? It looks, it looks extremely good. Then a bigger part of it, it just, despite all the unevenness from the frame down to this, to the overlay, to the bloating, to that, the camo turf really just makes it look um, extremely like it all works. Like it could be high and low. And if this was like teak decking, it would show everywhere. You would see shadows, it'd be horrible. But because it's a camo, the camo does such a good job of hiding everything, like even better than carpet, I would say. And it's cleaner, doesn't mildew, doesn't stink, doesn't get hot. It's the perfect thing. So in these seats, I salvaged these seats from a long time ago. One of these, I think that's an original seat. This is a newer seat. That one, you actually can feel hardware poking you in the butt. So that seat's just got to go. I have to go get a new seat. Um, but yeah, we just, well, that one doesn't even open. Oh, that's failed. Should have thought about that. Here. Those are the old compartments. We didn't do anything to line the in inner compartments because they're going to get trashed. But that's, so some of the stuff we kind of splurged on, like an aluminum bottom, because that was an original wood bottom. They're notorious for putting wood wood backing underneath the chairs. It always fails. So a little bit thicker, robust hinge riveted into the parent wall, welded onto that sheet of aluminum. 
And that's how we did it for the 1648. That's how we did it again here. And that actually, I don't ever see that failing. When we remember we also welded all those joints because just like how we showed you back there where there's just pieces riveted with no actual joint, we welded the joints because the section is always getting stepped on and abused. Every time I ever redid an old tracker or an old boat like this where the bench seat area was still somewhat intact, it was always failing right at the seats. So the first thing to go is the seats. Seats. Someone always stepped on the, the seats and it crushed it in or did something. And so that's, there's a few. And so I try to stay away from trackers because they, they give me headaches because those things are there. So I know if you get a tracker, they, once you pull the carpet off, you're going to start seeing all of it and it's there, but it's, it's whatever. Um, so we got wood hatches redone. Nate, you should make this. You should make just an extended long hinge like that. <laughs> start making that and selling that. Hey, that'd be a good idea. You could like, remake that. The people would love that because they could just convert a wood hatch right on top of it. It's like the ultimate hinge. Think about it. And th the reason those hinges never bowed in, in the initial one, and that was way crappier wood than this, it was because this hinge kept them straight all those years. It's just like five screws. <laughs> you can say whatever, and I can say whatever I want to say. I can say whatever I want to say about how this boat was before I gutted it. I could talk all my smack about it. But you want to know something? It does not matter. And why does it not matter? Because this boat lasted 30 years built the way it was. So, I mean, we all have our preferences on how things are built. We all have our standards on how things are built. And that's fine. That's like, that's like a personal thing. But in, in the end, was it safely built? Was it safely built? And did it last? And the answer is yes, it did. It did last. 30 freaking, this is a pre-2000 boat, 1980s, 1990s. Judging by the motor, like it was, it was 1980s. This is a 1980s boat. So 50 years, like a long time, it's old. It's older than me. The boat is older than me and I'm old. Like think about how old this boat was and it, it was it was it was going in shambles, but actually, really, if the motor had still worked, you could have still used this boat before we got it. It was still usable. Sure, it looked like crap, but it was it was still usable. It was still usable, and so we got to give credit. We we got to get rid of like the snobbery and 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 the stuff in this community because I don't know if this thing can be, get built the way it is and and live thirty years. Then I'm just saying like, all you guys are gonna be fine. You guys are all going to be fine. Your boat builds are going to look great. And they're probably going to last longer than this thing. Ow. I really got to put a folding trailer tongue on that thing. Uh, all right. So just check out this hatch. Okay. And this is, I'm proud of this hatch, but it's just a personal bias. There's nothing terribly special about it. It's, it's my favorite hatch. Why? Because I designed this a long time ago. Like in my attempt to break away from wood by making my first aluminum hatch, Without knowing how to weld at all, I pulled it off in the stupidest way. And that was, um, I got three quarter inch square tubing. And then I, I resined in the ends, which appeared to look like it was welded. And it was pretty, it was pretty cool. But so now that I welded, it's actually welded. But we actually have shims. Nate actually perfected this kit. He got shims and corner brackets that fit in between the angle when you cut it at an ID. And then you can rivet it in. So essentially you rivet it in from the top and you would be covering it with turf and you could never see the rivet holes and it looked like one solid piece that was like, you couldn't tell that it wasn't welded. It would look really, really good. But since um, we did yell, we did weld it um, every so often cross beams here, just had scrap sheets and pieced them together on one of the, one of the joints, riveted the top of the aluminum to the joint and then Riveted this little skin piece here. It's all, I think it's 060, 060 sheeting. It's pretty thin. You can see the sheet right there. It's thin. And then we had that, we had the, the stupid thing here. What is that? The latch? Yeah, I got the latch. And then the rod locker. I mean, you can see the video tomorrow, how bootleg the rod locker was and some things I had to do to fix it. But that turf got right in here, right in there. Looks pretty clean. That hole is a stupid hole, but it's, 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 it's all right. Like, what can you do with it? Like, let me see. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's fine. I mean, it's not the most aggressive rod locker, but when you got to get a few rods out of the way because because the, the deck's cluttered, yeah, it it, it, just, it does its job. What's going on here? What's happening? What I do? Is this oh the scissors? Okay, yeah. So, so that was good. The subfloor down here, we have two drains this time, flush with the turf, so the drain is never sitting higher than the turf, right there, and then right there. And then so no matter if we're leaning forward or backward, if there's water that gets into the floor, it's going to drain out. And then all the ends are sealed. Before we, we put down the turf, we sealed all the ends with silicone. Silicone. So everything is sealed. The edge of the deck here is actually sealed, um, I think, with a – I sealed it with gap filler, and then I epoxied over the gap filler. So that the ends are actually sealed extremely well. Like water cannot creep down in here and – get into anything inside the rod locker not so much but i i don't know there's nothing you could, there's some things you couldn't do like without gutting the whole frame and then doing your own thing with it i fought i fought myself every part of the way to not gut this whole boat completely and that's why i was able to get it done kind of stuck i stayed disciplined finally and just made it happen um this thing would about right now will probably last tremendously longer than um how it was built originally because for one Parts of it that needed to be welded are welded. And then all the parts of the wood that were wood are now thicker, more robust resin coated wood and not just the bootleg shit they were doing before. And then the subfloor was actually half inch. We upgraded to three quarter inch, which added like 10 pounds, but so much more strength. Remember, remember like most of the hatches, all these hatches back here are wood. The subfloor is wood and that whole front deck is wood. And so is the top up here. And it all feels extremely solid. You cannot tell. Like if I didn't, well, obviously you can tell if you really look closely to the grain, you'll see that you'll see the end of the grain. If I'd have had more time, then and I wasn't trying to just kind of rush this along as a rental boat, I would have uh, epoxied, used thickened epoxy over the grain after the initial resin had soaked into the grain and solidified, and then I could have just formed and shaped and smoothed out that epoxy like I did on my other personal, like my little 14 footer. And then you really seriously cannot tell it's wood. But not at first glance, unless you're just a pro. I don't know. But this one you can definitely tell I did not put near the work into finishing it to make it to make the fit to finish look good the way it did for the 14 footer. The 14 footer did come out better. But again, this is a rental. And then another thing, you might you might say this turf looks like poop. I say that it grows on you like fungus. You look at it for long enough, you starts you starts it starts to pill you, you start to appreciate it. It actually looks all right. I mean it, you compare it to all the other colors in hydro turf, it does look like poop looks like legit diarrhea but it's okay it's actually it's actually okay and um so it was part of the plan so here so here's the thing about the plan for um the rental boat so the other boat that had the 1640 edit i made it and everybody's like it's too nice do not rent that thing it'll get destroyed in a month they kept talking to people and people were like yeah you you know you got to be able to get a boat and send it on its way and look the other way I just hope they bring it back in one piece. Um, Cause like after a month, it could be unrecognizable from what it was when you initially introduced it in. And so that's, a, that was really insightful advice. Um, and he is kind of right. I just talked to a slew of people, a slew of guides, a slew of renters. And then a lot of it is, um, a lot of it is a little tough. So in, in my, in my deal, I was like, what can I do? What can I make the most robust looking inside interior and exterior that is very easy to maintenance if it's it's scratched or damaged and so what i came up was this color you can't actually make it look worse it already looks like crap this these side walls it's just straight flat earth rust-oleum camo paint it is over there somewhere you can spray flat paint on top of flat paint all day without it smudging or looking like you did it. So you can't make that any worse. This is a straight up haze gray Rust-Oleum like enamel paint. And it's the gloss, which the gloss does much better when, when contact with the water versus matte or satin or definitely flat. And so if I got to spray more of this on, I can just spray it on. If they scratch the side, so freaking what? Um... You know, like, see, the sides already scuffed up. I did this. Fishing right next to the buoys. That's me. 
This is going to be its life. Right? It's going to get abused. It is what it is. So, what am I going to, like, get something that looks great for so they can ruin in a week? You know, what, what am I going to do? Right? They're going to beat it up. Like, I don't know. You would think, you would think that somebody who's, like, made it most of their life to be able to, to generate a certain amount of income to where they could actually afford to rent a fishing boat for any amount of money because it's not cheap. Um, you would that would also in, entail a certain amount of, of default common sense in in knowledge, but it's not that way. It's not that way. I've lived in a lake town. I've seen a lot of things, and I and I look at these people. I'm like, how did you make it to adulthood? But these people are running around in diesels and like three hundred thousand dollar like wake boats and jet skis, and I'm like, and I'm like, okay, so yeah, you were successful somewhere in life. You definitely had a skill set worthy enough to like generate that it's so like so why isn't it here like now with the with with the boat like like where did where did it go so it's i i think that i'm gonna have a lot of these moments when i rent this boat and i just don't want to have them somebody else is going to actually be doing it we'll have a system and you, a lot of it's just going to be coming down to vetting people like if the guy doesn't can't figure out what what this is or the throttle and this and he did and i don't know you think you think they might just crash the boat immediately and it's your call i'll be like you know what get out of the boat i'm not running this thing to you you got to get out i think you're gonna hurt yourself and then you get it i mean you have to be uncomfortable conversations with people which i'm perfectly okay to do i'm a very disagreeable person i'll just i'll just be that way if i have to i won't i won't cater to somebody who i know is gonna like hurt themselves so it's but i will do that i don't know if the guy i'm gonna team up with is got a spine like that maybe he i hope he does he's gonna have to or the boat's gonna get wrecked so um yeah, it's, a, it's just about a game i think that's just really where we talk to a lot of people out here there's a lot of re rental companies not one that rents fishing boats but a lot of them and they give us their insight and they're like and they're like you got somebody and they just seem in they might have a lot of money but they just seem incapable they can't grasp basic concepts so I'm, sorry it's not safe there's another rental company down the street go talk to them like you can do that so i don't know Oh, no. And then there's, there's insurance. There's a bunch of other things. So we're going to get into it, and we're going to try our best. It's going to start out small. And obviously, the Tiny Boat Nation is, is our parent company. It is, is the biggest deal here. So we were going to be um, – this will always take precedence. We're, yeah, over, over any secondary company like this rental thing. But it's just nice to try, to try to get it going. I was scheming on it for a year, year and a half. I was like, I can build these boats. I can maintain them. I just need people because you can't do it alone it's you need people so so that's that's kind of how it is so if you ever in have a so you can rent this boat and then you can just go and and do things so yeah any so what are you guys up to how does running work with boater license so you don't need an actual boater's license down here in arizona arizona is kind of very lawless you have no horsepower restrictions. Everybody who's driving the boat is generally either drunk or 11. <laughs> They're very, it's, it's scary. I do a lot of my fishing at night because everybody's too scared to go at night. So you gotta just, uh, I don't know. There's, you just don't need a license. You could be 12. You could actually be 12 and drive a boat in, 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 in Arizona. Arizona actually has the most boats per capita than any other state in the country. Which is, con which is really surprising considering that you would think Florida would beat you, but it doesn't. It doesn't. So that, that means Arizona has got close to the same amount of boats as Florida, but it's a smaller state. So per capita, we have, we have more boats per, per capita than any other state. And uh, I'll tell you, I live out here in Havasu, and the boats that are rowing through here, man, there is no taming those boats. Like, I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's kind of crazy. Um... Yeah, I don't know. You can just be 12 and go take a boat out. You don't need a license. But it's stupid because, like, because San Bernardino County and Nevada can patrol the same waterway. And then they have standards, but they can't actually hold us accountable when they pull us over, but they can still pull us over. It's, it's stupid to have three, three, three spots of law enforcement, like, on the lake. I think it's dumb because you all can't enforce the same rules. Why are all the same you, like, here in this stretch? Like, it's... It's dumb, but it's, I don't really actually get it. So what am I doing with the Nitro fishing with Matthew? That's the next boat up. 
That's the next boat up. But um, I kind of jumped the line. I wanted to finish this thing up. I wanted to get my content on it, test it, and then get it out, get it rented, start that business, and then move on from it. But my way of kind of moving on from it is obviously doing this one last live with this boat now, and then giving you guys the end reveal tomorrow, which will be coming out tomorrow. Please stick around and watch that. And then um, onto the nitro. Like the next time you see a live in this garage, the nitro will be in here. And um, this boat will not be here. This little boat will be away from me. Thank heaven. Like I, I have a boat problem. And uh, I don't, it's kind of like an episode of Hoarders. If Hoarders had boats, like for a problem. Like, like that would, that would, that would kind of be me. So I'm trying to, I'm trying to, to, you know, dehoard my whole flock. I keep getting more boats. It's very hard. It's very, it's, it's very difficult to, uh, I don't know. So I, I just gotta, I gotta figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, <laughs> I don't know what else to talk about. Um, but yeah, that's what I got going on. Let's, uh, are bass fishing boats the only builds in the future? No, I'm actually going to stop. I've been trying to stop doing bass boats. Like, I've been trying to do anything else. We've done some other things. We've done some crazy looking fishing boats. I mean, it's always going to revolve around fishing, but it's not going to revolve around. I mean, this is not technically, it, not really, it's, it kind of is a bass boat, but it's, it's more or less just a universal fishing boat for, for people who would just like to be here. And, uh and play with this anyways hey, check this out real quick i forgot to mention by the way all the products for this like the turf um these day boxes and i just talked to you about the day boxes and uh these those are all those are all tagged to the live please check out i'll talk about the significance of these here in a second and the significance of the rpd console remember uh, like for the 1648 i welded a console together and it was the biggest pain. It came out really nice. Like, I'm glad I put the work in. But all in all, the cost to effectiveness, cost to effectiveness ratio of just buying an RPD console like this versus welding one, this is so much better and more efficient and does the exact same thing. Um, and it's extremely easy to install. It's got, a, it's got a little catch lip there, which it will attach to a gun all thick enough. But I, I just I welded three-quarter inch there just, just so it fit down there a little bit more flush. Then... It just bolted. It, it has little screws, holes back there already pre pre molded in there. You just like drill go through the hole and attach the bolts. Thing attaches right to it. So it attaches right to it. Now it's got that little wall that you can trim, which I trimmed. And then it's got it's got a plastic piece that's aluminum because I lost the plastic piece and then found it. But um. But yeah, that's this was. And then you just install it. It comes with plastic rivets, so you can you can just plastic rivet it down there, and it's and it's us ready to go. I installed these switches in here. Um, yeah, check out these switches. There's actually that's actually backwards, but it's all right. It'll work. Um, attach this rotary steering console in there from Beaver. You know the cheap Amazon console that's in here. It's extremely stiff. It's kind of a piece of crap. But it's too late. It's in here. And then, um, what would you guys ask real quick? I saw also a question. Screws or rivets to use for hatches to a wood deck? I used uh, self-tappers for pretty much all this. This time. Um, normally, I would use rivets because they, they give a legit mushroom on the bottom and they, they don't pull out. But if you put enough self-tappers copiously through and you don't over-torque them, you're not gonna have a problem with, with, with torque out. Like, especially if you resin coat over the deck, the rivets, I mean, the screws by nature can't back out of the resin. They're like stuck there forever. So it's just like the same thing, almost. It's with way less, with way less headache and hassle. It takes like one second to countersink the, the part of the wood and put the, put the count and put the screw right in. So it's just like, but again, there's the RPD consoles. And then another thing, so I've always been talking about, um, you can have hatches. I mean, this boat's fairly basic layout. One major hatch in the front, right? One basic rod locker hatch. The majority of the, of the, of the storage is in the back and in the, and in the center compartment right here, which that's actually a hatch. That, that's actually one of Nate's hatches. It's a pretty sweet little hatch too. Forgot to even talk about that one. That was there. 
But um, and then under the seats, of course. So that's you got to think that's going to be a huge pain for the person trolling up front. You got to run all the way back here to get something. Go back up. It gets annoying real quick. After like two or three times, you're over it. Or you're over it. And so we're always talking about ways to kind of fill the gaps because it's all about the hor it's all about the horizontal cabinetry system. 40 people in the live. If you guys haven't hit left a like for the live, please please hit the like button. Appreciate it. But anyways, it's all about the cabinetry system. The horizontal cabinetry system. The better the system you have, the faster you can operate. The better you can like make adjustments, the quicker you can make adjustments. And you know, a, a good boat kind of turns minutes into seconds. Right? Right, inches into miles, all those, all those cliches, but really, actually, minutes into seconds is a real thing. So, meaning you can have just one hatch, have all your stuff in there, and deal with what comes of that, which is at least it's not all over the deck, at least you're not stepping on it, at least it's kind of organized, at least you know where it is, but then you got to rummage in there and grab things. And so, you, you get away from, from hours, you turn hours into minutes, but then, like, you turning minutes into seconds, what does that mean? That means you have stuff on demand, like, you know exactly where it is. One hand movement, you grab it. One, and so that is these. That is these. And so I knew it. I used to actually use these because there was no legitimate bridge between hatches and even day boxes to their credit, which were the closest thing you had to like a one handed movement, like to grab something right on the right on right on the fly. But I'd always try and get these tackle web systems, like these little these little mesh ones and then place these on the wall they suck they i mean look at them that was actually the best option until we until nate started making these so these are fantastic these uh, and these are probably empty right now because the boat's kind of cleaned out but we had stuff in here everywhere we almost didn't we didn't even use the back storage and there was four of us in here yesterday demoing this boat my my son and his two friends plus me and if we had a bait we hung it if we had a tool we put it in the slot. If we had anything, baits, a tackle box, worm bags, you know, like anything, just, you know, terminal tackle, stuck it right in here. And then this, this wall was actually the, probably the most useful wall. Held my terminal tackle, held other stuff. The kids had things. They had backpacks. They took out their most crucial items, stuck it in here. They had access into them, access to immediately. Scissors were constantly used. Pliers are constantly used. You got to get better, better color pliers because really these kept disappearing with the turf. It was very annoying. I didn't think about that. But if you're gonna, if you're gonna run hydro turf, just think about that. You know, just and then the cup caddies. Obviously, only having one cup caddy on this boat has failed. There should be like three. One here. I should, I should drill one up here, and I think I will. I got one. I'll just put flush right there. One there, one there, and there really needs to be one over there, and then. Well, there's then we ran out of room to play to put to put cup caddies, but yeah, like the whole point is, look, line, anything in there, water bottles, anything goes in here and they're solid. They don't bend. They don't bloat. They're powder coated. They're machined. They do three major functions. Four, even if you talk about it, they're pretty sweet. Um, a lot of people complain about the price. But considered how much those cost versus have the time and effort it takes to even make a wooden hatch, let alone buy one of these hatches, these make so much more sense. You can actually kit out a whole basic boat or a basic job boat with just these attached to the bench seats. And like, I tell you, it's money. Even on the RPD, they make their own little version here of the rod holder slash tool holder there. That's an actual add-on to the unit. It looks pretty good. I mean, it, the whole thing worked actually really, really well. Fished four people um, yesterday again in the... In the final demo before we actually release the actual final reveal video for this boat tomorrow. And um, I'll tell you what, between the hatches and the day boxes, it was it was great. It was great. Uh, how is the other one attached to the small to the wall of the boat? What what do you mean? Uh what what it, oh I don't know. They're attached with just self-tappers, self-drillers. Those are like lath screws because I, I didn't have nothing else. I just attached them with lath screws right in. I attached them all in. 
So right, right to the aluminum wall. I just attached it with last screws. You could just use rivets too. But once they're in, they're in. And um, they don't move. They don't shake. They don't rattle. They're very well made. They're, they're welded. And I don't know. Like it takes, it takes a lot for us to actually make them that way. And so they, they are a little bit, I guess, I don't know. It's hard to justify the value. You have to, it's one of those units. I don't know what I got to do to market it correctly, but it's one of those units. You have to just be there to experience just how well it bridges the gap between that nonsense back there and here when you're floating around trying to make adjustments. And you know, like, I don't know. How many times have you, what's going on, Robert? How are you, man? How many times, be honest with you guys, like be honest in the chat. How many times have you guys like rolled over a pack of fish you did not have the right rig and like you were, you immediately tried to like fix that and make the adjustment before the fish left, but like you didn't. So I've had all those moments, really a lot, a lot of my systems in all these boats have been, have been specifically targeted to get rid of those moments where I failed, right? Where, where I knew exactly what it would catch them. I knew exactly where it was and it was just moving through the horizontal cabinetry system and getting it, getting it making that adjustment in seconds, not minutes, because minutes, you lose it, right? They're here, they're gone. Gone in seconds. If they're gone in seconds, you need to move in seconds. Seconds. Seconds all day. And that's why all my last boat builds, including the light skiff, have these, and they have multiple ones. Like, one's not enough. You need, like, three, four, six. You need some of your compartments. You need a lot. So, I don't know, just, like, it's something else. It's something else. I think, I think these day boxes will be used much more than the stock hatches, um, people, when they brought their backpacks yesterday, it was a pretty good simulation because people are going to bring their backpacks. People always bring backpacks and stuff, which is why the cockpit's so big and the deck is so small up here. So you shove those all, we shoved all the backpacks, shoved like three or four backpacks right in the side up there and still had this whole walkway running through. Everybody shoved stuff in the day boxes, the vertical boxes, and nobody shoved anything in the storage. The back has a lot of storage, guys. Storage here. Nate, you left all your dirty worm cups in there too, by the way. It stank real bad. Thanks. You got this storage. And you got this one. And you got an equivalent one on the other side. So you got five areas of storage back here. It was pretty much these boxes rendered all that storage unnecessary to even use with four people in the boat. So, like, I don't know what to tell you guys. Like, I don't know. Maybe I just got to think about the right words to say. But anyways, that's what I got going on. Um, thank you guys for tuning into this live and I don't know how many times I'll be able to run this live because I've just been really busy trying to be back on content. I, I, I hoarded my workload very, very heavily at the beginning of this year. Um, so I could beat the heat and then just have a, have a bunch of content to sit back on and then release that over time, at least for a month or so. So then we also have some things going. I had a pontoon boat that I would like to build. I don't know if I can. I have a Tracker V18. We also have that Nitro. The Nitro is the next one to be in line. There is nothing else aside from the Nitro. And maybe you can turn the Nitro into a rental boat too. I don't know. The rental boat, the Nitro is either going to get sold or rented once it's done. But we will have a really good tutorial on that once it's completed. So that one will be in the garage next. We will be doing the subfloor. I'll be showing you how to do that. And just tying up any loose edges and gaps around the actual deck. And then we'll be going inside, which the inside stinks because we used a bunch of chemicals to lift off all that glue and carpet and the residual effect of that was all the interior smells like xylene and stinks and no matter how long you leave the vents open it stinks forever we had to figure out how to unstink all that to not get a chemical high which is why it was so crucial on not using any chemicals to undo the glue here we did it all with 220 grit sandpaper took all of it off orbital sander and um no i ain't quit no that nitro is not worthy of a garmin force and Nitro's gonna get a Fortrex. And it's lucky it's getting that. You get a Fortrex and a 36 volt lithium. And uh, maybe maybe a basic graph here. Just enough. Just enough to like get somebody going on the lake. Might get a basic nine inch graph of some sort. Maybe, maybe that's pushing it. I have a seven. I had a Garmin uh, Striker 7 I was gonna stick on that thing. But you never, I don't know, you never know. It's, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Anyways, I gotta get going guys. I appreciate you guys here. Um, when we do start putting out the nitro, we will start doing giveaways again because we have things to give away, but they need to go with in series the nitro. So we'll see you guys back on that next one. And I will talk to you guys later. See ya.